Well, hi, everyone, and welcome back to Pushing the Limits. It's fantastic to have you with me, and I am jumping out of my skin for excitement today because I have someone that I've been just so looking forward to interviewing, uh, a, a an amazing author, James Nestor, who is going to be sharing his research and his book, uh, which is really a game changer. Breathe is the name of the book. Um, and James is coming to us all the way from San Francisco today. So welcome to the show, James. Fabulous to have you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so, James, can you just give us a bit of a background into your who you are and uh, your your background, and how the heck did you end up writing a book about breathing, and why do we need to know about it? <laughs> so, I'm a journalist, and I write for science magazines and outdoor magazines. I've been doing that for years and years and years. And I think the real jumping off point for me was when I was sent out to go to Greece to write about the World Freediving Championship. And even though I've spent my life near the ocean, I'm a surfer, I'm a swimmer, I'm a body surfer, all that, I had never really spent too much time under the ocean. And I had never seen anyone freedive before because the water is very cloudy here on the West Coast. There's not a lot of places to do this. So mm -hmm. I remember going out in this boat, it was the first day of the competition and just watching these people take a single breath and go down 300, 400 feet on, on a single breath of air and yeah. come back four minutes later. And just, it was like, they just, you know, were answering emails, just like, okay, next up, uh, back, back for lunch. It's like, what the hell is going on here? Uh, I had understood that this was absolutely impossible. And yet here are these people, various sizes, various forms, big, tall, large, small, all that, that, that had mastered this thing. And I got to be friends with a few of them who took me into this other side of free diving outside of the competitive free diving, which I just thought was, was pretty insane. Um, and they allowed me to understand free diving as this meditation. And of course, breathing is at the core of this meditation. And by mastering this art of breathing, we could not only dive deep, but we can heat ourselves up, heal ourselves and do so many other things. Wow, that's so, so that was a, the jumping off point in, in for this interest. And yeah, I've, I've, taken an interest in free diving too and um, oh my gosh what they do is pretty next level insane I don't think I'm crazy enough to really have a go at that <laughs> to be fair but absolute admiration for what they do and how they do it and the everything that they have to overcome but okay so if we just jump in now then to how does you know what can we learn from these free divers and, and other traditional breathing techniques and why is it important for the everyday person to be to be understanding how their breath works and the physiology, which we'll get into, which I found absolutely mind blowing and thought, why has nobody told me this? Um, and why did why does the, why should someone listening to this actually be interested? Hmm. So the free divers told me that the the only way to hold your breath is to master this art of breathing. And it was also something interesting to, to see all of these different people and they all had these enormous chests. Uh, they had expanded their lung capacity. Some people double the average adult lung capacity wow. Wow. by force of will. They were not born this way. So it made me think about how malleable the body is depending on what inputs we give to it. And so I got back to San Francisco and I wrote another book that, that featured free divers. But in, in the back of my mind, that book was called Deep. And it looks at the human connection from the very surface to the very bottom of the deepest sea, magnetoreception, echolocation, all that. But as I was researching that book and writing it, I just kept finding more and more information about breathing, about how so many of us in the West, including in the medical world, view breathing as just this binary thing. As long as we were breathing, we're, we're healthy, good. we're okay, mm -hmm. we're alive. When you're not breathing, that, that's bad. You're, you're dead or you have a serious problem. But that is such the wrong way of looking at this. It's like saying, as long as you were eating, you're getting food, you're getting nutrients. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's what you eat that's so important and it's how you breathe that's so important. So I was lucky enough to then meet a bunch of leading experts in this field who've been studying this stuff 
for decades. They've been publishing in these weird scientific journals. No one's been reading their stuff. Yeah. And I thought, why the hell hasn't anyone told me this? Like I'm middle-aged. I've been mouth breathing through <laughs> most of my life. I've been, whenever I was working out or surfing, I'm just <sighs> thinking yeah. I'm getting more oxygen in. And this is so damaging to the body and no one was talking about it. So this book took me so long because I couldn't understand why some researchers on one side were saying how you breathe has no effect on your asthma, has no effect on your body on your brain and this other side was saying they're a hundred percent wrong here's all the data so it was going through all that and weeding through all that that took me a while but i think at the end i finally found the, the truth behind all of this you certainly did and the book is such a deep deep dive like you know and i've been talking to some friends about you know reading this book and and they're beginning how can you have a whole book on breathing and I'm like, you have no idea. You could probably write 10 books on breathing and it's so powerful. And, and as an athlete, I've, you know, I was just saying to you prior to the recording, I've spent my entire life as an asthmatic since I was two years old. I have a very small lung capacity. I have a low VO2 max. Despite that, I decided to become an endurance athlete. Go figure that one out. Got some mental issues, obviously. Um, but I'd spent my entire athletic career breathing in my mouth in places like Death Valley and the Sahara and the Himalayas and altitude and you know freezing cold temperatures and and all of the problems that that brought and so this book has been a life-changing thing for me personally unfortunately I'm no longer a competitive athlete bugger you know like I didn't get that <laughs> that memo back then but now training hundreds of athletes um wow I can start to influence them and change them and already started to adopt some of the the information into the the programs that we're using so super powerful information and and really important so okay now let's go into a little bit the physiology of breath because we sort of think if if i take deep breaths and breathe often and faster if I'm running, uh, then I, and I'm going along, <laughs> I'm getting as much oxygen as my body can get. Why is that completely upside down? It is upside down, and it's so counterintuitive. It took me months to get my head around this, even though we've known this. Scientific papers were published on this 115 years ago, showing very clearly that you need a balance of carbon dioxide and oxygen to operate effectively and efficiently. And when we breathe too much, we can offload too much CO2, which actually makes it harder for us to bring oxygen throughout the body. And if you don't believe me right now, you can breathe 20 or 30 heavy breaths. You might feel some tingling in your fingers yep. or some lightness in your head. Yep. This is not from an increase of oxygen to these areas, but a decrease of circulation. Wow. Because you need a balance of CO2 for circulation, for vasodilation. This is, it is integral to providing blood and nutrients to our body. And for some reason, as, as Westerners, we just think more is better. More is always more. <laughs> that is not the way of uh, the proper way of thinking about this when, when you talk about breathing. You want to breathe as closely in line with your metabolic needs as possible. Why would you, it's like being in a car. Why would you be revving the motor everywhere you're going? I had a stop sign just revving the motor. When you were over breathing, that's exactly what you're doing. You're causing a bunch of wear and tear on your heart, on your vascular system, and you're sending stress signals to, to your mind. People like you are very strong-willed and will fight through it, right? Mm. You'll just keep going. You're in pain. I don't care. I'm going to finish this race. I'm going to make it happen. <laughs> yeah. Compensation is different than health. Oh, yeah. and, and so this is why so many professional athletes, they'll be really good for a few years. The minute they stop, diabetes. Chronic yeah. health problems. Thyroid, Their bodies, diabetes, metabolic disorders. Problems. Yeah. yeah. Like, so, what the hell? You've spent your uh, life being a disciplined athlete. Uh, I, I, yeah. I'm, I, you know, I'm struggling with hypothyroid, for example, uh, and high blood sugars. And I'm lean and I'm, you know, like, what the heck? <laughs> it's like, wow. And, uh, and, and 
I hope through the breathing and, and some of the other stuff that I'm doing that I can reverse some of the damage because you because it is so counterintuitive. So that carbon dioxide, that was a real mind bender for me because I've always understood carbon dioxide as a negative thing. You know, we want to breathe it out. We want to get it out of the system. It's the end result of the, you know, what do you call it? The electron chain and the, you know, ATP production. And we're producing this carbon dioxide. We're going to get it out. And, that's not the case, is it? It, it is a controller of, of uh, the acidity in the blood. It, it is something that we want to train. Our chemoreceptors need to be trained uh, in order to be able to tolerate more carbon dioxide. So let's just dive into the weeds a little bit on the actual physiology that I've just touched on there so that we can actually get to the bottom of this carbon dioxide, the mind bender, really. Mm -hmm. So when we take breath in, it enters in through our lungs and the bronchioles to these little air sacs, the alveoli. And from there, it goes through various uh, layers and enters into red blood cells. The, mm -hmm. the vast majority of, of oxygen enters into red blood cells. There's some free floating, but, but not much. So in those red blood cells, there's something like 270 million hemoglobin. Yep. And so then it enters into this hemoglobin. And it's, you know, it's funny. Why would, when we're working out, why would we get more oxygen in one area than another? So CO2 is the signaling molecule. So where oxygen is gonna detach is in areas where there is CO2. So uh -huh. oxygen isn't gonna attach uh, uh, otherwise. So, so you need this healthy balance of CO2. We have a hundred times more CO2 in our bodies than we do oxygen. Wow. Okay, so this is this very carefully controlled system that needs to be in balance. And our bodies are so wonderful at keeping us alive. So when we become imbalanced, all these other things happen. If we become too acidic, we'll learn to breathe more, right? We'll trigger that. If we become too alkaline, our kidneys will release bicarbonate. So all of this is incredible and so important. Mm. Compensation, different than health. We yes. can compensate for a very long time. Imagine you can live maybe 40 years eating garbage crap food, eating Fritos, that doesn't mean you're, you're healthy. No offense <laughs> to Fritos, D delicious, absolutely <laughs> delicious. But you, you know, it, it doesn't mean you're healthy. So yeah. the, the reason why um, you have to understand this balance of CO2 and oxygen is because you can't just understand CO2 as a waste product. It's still considered this in medical school. Oh, yeah. it's a waste product, you, you yeah. don't need it. But people yeah. who study this know that it is absolutely essential to have that balance. You don't want too much, but you don't want too little. You want your body to be able to operate at peak efficiency without having to go through all those compensations, right? To keep you there. Exactly. So, so when we breathe in, we, uh, our, when I say, when I hold a breath, and I'm, I'm holding my breath for a long time, as long as I can. And then that's that horrible urgency that comes up and you start to, your diaphragm starts to make that sort of hiccup thing. And this is actually the chemoreceptors in the brain, which is the area that is what I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, that is measuring the CO2 levels more than anything in the blood, not the oxygen levels. And it's the, the CO2 going up and then the body's going, oh, time to breathe. And it makes you do that, you know, hiccup thing in, in order to make you breathe. And when I'm doing my breathing exercises that I've learned from you, um, I, I let that reflex go for a while while I'm training my body and to be able to accept more carbon dioxide and that will help me be a better athlete with a better VO2 max hopefully and make me faster and so on um, but it's the it's the CO2 that's actually pushing the oxygen into the cells as well isn't it and that was another mind bender as well it's an exchange. So you can think about those red blood cells as this cruise ship, right? So, and they're full of oxygen and they cruise to areas where there are other passengers that want to get on. This is CO2 and they exchange. Mm -hmm. So CO2 hops on as oxygen hops off. off. Yep. And, and this, is, this is just how it works. So that need to breathe, you're hundred percent right. A lot of people think, I'm going to exhale, hold my breath. Oh, I don't have enough oxygen. I need to breathe. No, that is dictated by rising carbon dioxide levels. And so many of us are so sensitized to CO2 that we can't hold a breath more than 10 seconds yeah. without going, ah, ah, 
but they've done a study with athletes and they found that to very comfortably hold your breath over 25 seconds, 89% of those athletes will not have any breathing dysfunction. So this is a great practice to do. And this is why this is used in so many different breathing techniques for so long. The ancient Chinese were doing breath holds, uh, pranayama, ancient Hindus were doing breath holds for, for thousands of years is to exhale softly and to hold your breath calmly. You don't want to be struggling and feeling your diaphragm moving just calmly. When you feel a little teaspoon of discomfort, you breathe and you calculate how long that is. Don't mm -hmm. look at this as a competition. I know that there's a lot of very yeah. people out here. No, you can <laughs> co compete late later. So what you want to do is to get your CO2 tolerance higher because by having a higher amount of CO2, which is really a normal amount of CO2, your body can operate better. Um, you will have more circulation. Oxygen will detach more easily. And when you're doing endurance sports, this is what you want. You don't want to use energy for things you don't have to use energy for. Oh. Um, so you want to be burning clean and tight. And that's what this allows you to do. So this is about efficiency, isn't it? And um, um, I remember you saying that the average person is breathing 12 to 18 times a minute on average. Um, and ideally, we should be around the five and a half or say six times a minute would be ideal. So breathe light to breathe right was one of the the, the catchphrases that that stuck in my head. And, and that's my trigger for, oh, I'm, I'm over breathing again. And so it's actually slowing down our breathing rate and not increasing the volume so much as diaphragmatic breathing. So using the deep lower lobes of our lungs to actually get the breath in um, and doing it a lot slower. And, and why are we all, you know, doing it 12 to 18 times a minute and over, over breathing, which is, yeah. It is and sometimes a lot more than that. Mm. I mean, I've talked to clinicians who see people breathing 25, 30 times a minute, just, <sighs> yep. and they've been doing this for decades and their bodies are just destroyed. Wow. wow. So it's, it's, these things become a habit after a while and our body gets used to that cycle of compensation. And we start acknowledging this as normal. We start mm. thinking having migraines is normal. Having cold toes and cold fingers all the time is normal. Being exhausted all the time is normal. None of this is normal. And it's especially in, if you look at modern populations of what's considered normal now, mm. I mean, what 15% of, of Americans have diabetes, 25% yep. have sleep so apnea. 10% have autoimmune, like what is going on here? And that this is just accepted that, oh, it's just, you know, I've my, my diabetes, Aging. I take my, 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 <laughs> my drugs. So, so anyway, I'm getting off track here. No, I um, love it. I love it. So you, when, when this becomes a habit, again, compensation different than, than health and a wonderful practice to try is to breathe in at a rate of about five to six seconds and breathe out at around that same rate. I put in the book 5.5, yeah. but then people have been writing me saying I'm a half a second <laughs> off. I don't, I'm just like, oh my God. So now I'm saying anything in that range. And if that's too difficult for you, slow it down. Go go three seconds in, three seconds out. It's per. this is not a competition. This is about acclimating your body. So we can't breathe this way all the time. That's gonna be impossible. But whenever you become aware of your breath that you're breathing too much, you can bring your breath back by breathing this way and recondition it. And the point of all these exercises is not to think about them. You wanna do them often enough that you're always breathing through your nose, that yeah. you're always breathing lightly and slowly. And that range of diaphragmatic movement, especially for athletes, I cannot tell you how essential this is. When you're breathing too much, okay, here's what's happening. You're breathing up into your chest, which is extremely inefficient. Yep. There's more blood further down in your lungs, so it can participate much more, uh, much better in gas exchange. But you're also doing something else. You're taking air into your, your mouth, your throat, your bronchi, bronchioles, none of which participate in gas dead exchange. Yeah, so you bring yeah. it in, you go... I'm using uh, maybe 50% of, of that breath. Yep. If you slow down with the same volume, six liters a minute to about six or seven breaths, right? Per minute, 
your efficiency goes up 35%. Wow. 35%. And if you you think that's not going to make a difference when you're running for for five hours, (laughs) crazy, you're crazy. (laughs) If you look at uh, Kimpongi, I forget his name. Kimchogi, yeah. Yeah, 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 Kimchogi. Check out how he's breathing, you know, an hour and a half, extremely light. Wow. He's completely in control. You can hardly see his chest and he is in the zone. Sanya Richards Ross was the top female sprinter in the world for 10 years. Check out how she's breathing through the nose, in control, destroying everyone else and all of her competitors everyone behind her. Are... <sighs> <sighs> so it takes a me. while, which, which is why people don't. You're going to see a decrease in performance when you switch. Okay, guaranteed. Yeah. It's going to go down. If you stick with it, it's going to go up. Uh, I don't want to say that it's true for everyone, but I would say 95%. And the the breathing experts, the elite trainers I've worked with have told me 100% of the people they've converted, their performance goes up and the recovery is cut by half. Wow. And that, I mean, who the hell doesn't want that as an athlete? You're fighting for 1%. So when we're talking, you know, such massive possible changes that don't rely on your genetics and don't rely on you know things that you can't control anyway and uh uh, like for me uh transitioning has been hard i'll be honest because i was completely uh, congested all the time and that's why i'd heard that nasal breathing because that's the next thing we'll discuss that nasal breathing was very very important for a number of reasons i didn't really understand why but I was like, well, I can't breathe through my nose. It's just blocked the whole time. And I don't have a, a shit show in hell of doing that. So, well, well, I'll, I'll carry on doing my breathing. And then when I learned how to decongest my nose, and sometimes it will take me two or three breaths. And the first time, uh, the first you know couple of weeks when I was doing it, my nose was running and I wasn't getting anywhere. And I'm like, it's not working. But I pushed through. I pushed through that phase. And now I can run for like a 10 Ks at a fairly good pace, uh, completely nasal breathing. If I do the warm up phase properly, if I go out the door and just try and do it straight out the gate, it won't work. I need to do the walking, holding my breath and get that cleared first. And then I can get into my training and then I can hold it. And the first 10 minutes, I'm still finding it a little bit like I want to breathe with my mouth, that, that instinct is there but I'm slowly training myself into that system and seeing I can actually, you know, I can actually run for a good hour just through my nose without any problems. And I've also not done the high intensity. So I backed off the super high intensity because I know I'm automatically going to open my mouth when it gets to that. Um, So while I'm in this transition phase, I'm not doing anything beyond that sort of aerobic capacity level. And I think I need to, that's, just to 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 adapt but so there's a huge like so people listening out there if you are congested and you think well this is all well and good guys but there's no way in hell that i'm going to be able to breathe through my nose think again there is it's just a matter of being taught how to do it and that's a pretty simple couple of exercises um that were you know that's in the book um and, and can really really help us if you persevere through it and then i expect to see improvements in my vo2 max and all all the rest of it now Let's let's talk a little bit about the the reason why it has to be nasal breathing, and so it's not just about breathing slowly. We've talked about breathing slowly. We've talked about uh, diaphragmatic breathing. We've talked about CO two and the role that we don't want our CO two levels too low in the body. Let's talk now about the whole. Um, where was I going, James? Help me out. I've just had a. You, you wanted to talk about breathing. You want to talk about fitness. You want to talk about nasal breathing. Nasal breathing. <laughs> there you go. I had a, I had a, I had a moment. Um, so nasal. So we want to un- understand the physiology of the nose and why the nose is what we want to be breathing with rather than our mouth. So I want to mention a few things, a few more things about running. This may seem overkill, but just a couple of points. So what I've heard from various instructors, uh, Patrick McEwen is a mm-hmm. world-renowned uh, mm-hmm. th- breathing therapist. Top got Brian McKenzie, the same thing. Yep. They say never work, out, never work out harder than you can breathe correctly. Mm. So if you're entering the zone, your mouth is open, slow it down and build your base and work up from there. 
sometimes it took Dr. John Duyard, it took him six months to fully acclimate. But once you get there, you are going to find a power in yourself that you did not know existed. And this has been proven time and time again. When Carl Stahl was working with the Yale running team and the U.S. Olympic running team, he said that these people suffered way more sicknesses, respiratory problems, mm -hmm. asthma, COPT than anyone else. And he said they pushed through it because they're competitors. They're going to push through it. Fighters, but they were a complete, yeah. complete mess. So there has to be a slight shift in thinking of like, you have to accept your performance is going to go down for a little bit. Uh, right now is a good time to do that. We're still in a pandemic. So, you know, once things open <laughs> up, you'll be kicking, kicking everyone's ass. And, and that's not a, not a bad thing. But, but just know that this is, this is a wave. This is a process. Um, so the reason why you want to be doing this, uh, we'll get to nasal breathing now, is uh, I will bring on my guest. He's been waiting over here patiently. Oh, is, see, for the people who aren't watching this, I'm holding up a cross section of a human skull. You can see the nose right here. When you breathe through the nose, you're forcing air through this labyrinth. Wow. It's so similar to a seashell. It's called the nasal concha. Ah. So seashells have their, uh, their shells this way to keep invaders out, to keep pathogens out, right? Ah. Our noses serve the exact same function. This is our first line of defense. So when we breathe through our nose, we're heating air, which is important in cold climates. We're humidifying it, which is very important in dry climates. We're pressurizing it. We're conditioning it. We're removing particulate, which is important if you live in a city or basically anywhere else now. We're helping to fight more viruses. So uh, there will be a smaller mm -hmm. viral load breathing through the nose. And we condition this air. So by the time it enters our lungs, it is properly conditioned to be more easily absorbed. When you're breathing through your mouth, you can consider the lungs as an external organ yeah. because they're just exposed to everything in your environment. So not only that, not only is this the most effective filter we have, is it forces us to breathe more slowly. This is a self-regulating device. Because it's more How long did it Yeah. How long did it take me to, to take that breath? It took a while. How long does this take? <gasps> yeah. N nothing. Yeah. So that slower breath with that pressure allows us to gain 20% more oxygen breathing through our nose than equivalent breaths through our mouth. Oh, Again, yeah. if you think this is going to make no difference to you, you're absolutely crazy. <laughs> um, and this is simple science. Uh, you know, this isn't controversial stuff. No, this is simple science, but not well known until your book came out and became a, a you know worldwide best-selling book. Thank goodness, because this stuff needs to be out there. And I'm constantly because I'm deep in the weeds and in researching, you know, all the time and biohacking and the latest longevity and the goodness knows what. I'm just always into the the, the latest and greatest, and I'm constantly surprised at how, you know, the, some fantastic information never sees the light of day because of the systems that are in place or, or traditions and laws and stuff. And it's like, wow, we have to get this information out there. And this is one of those times when I'm thinking, thank goodness someone has put this into, you know, a book that's readable for people to understand the science without having to do such a deep dive themselves. And I think that that's really important. And that nasal, um, you know, nasal breathing also, it does another thing that I found really, really interesting was all about the nitric oxide. Um, can you explain what nitric oxide is and what it does in the body and why the nose is so important in that regard? Nitric oxide is this amazing molecule that our bodies produce that plays an essential role in vasodilation. Uh, having more nitric oxide will decrease your chances of having a stroke. It will decrease your chances of having a heart attack. It will increase circulation to your brain. I mean, wow. I could go on and on here. Wow. There's, it's no coincidence that, that the drug Sidenafil, also known as Viagra, guess what it does? <laughs> it releases nitric oxide in your body. That's exactly. how it functions. Yeah, so, yeah. So we get six that. times... Uh, one study showed that we get six times more nitric oxide breathing through our nose than we do through our mouth. And if we hum, mm, we get 15 times more nitric oxide. So this has wow. an incredible effect on the body. And especially now there are 11 clinical trials right now where they're giving patients with COVID, guess what? Nitric oxide. Holy <laughs> and, heck. Wow. 
and and apparently according to Nobel laureate Louis Ignaro it's it's working wonderfully well and these studies are going to be out soon oh, uh, I heard something my brother-in-law is an ER doctor my father-in-law is a pulmonologist so we talk all about this stuff and the vast majority of the people suffering the worst symptoms of COVID are people with chronic inflammation. And yep. as an observer observational study, they're also mouth breathers. Yep. Uh, and this, this was known 100 years ago. They were saying uh, 75 to 80% of the people with tuberculosis are mouth breathers, chronic wow. mouth breathers. So there's been no official study on this. Just the, This is just observational stuff. Mm. Don't, mm. don't go write me about this, that you were nasal breathing, <laughs> got COVID. It can happen. It can but happen it, still. We're not saying that. <laughs> it, it, to, to me, but, but we know that, that that can happen. But we also know something else, that breathing through the nose will help you defend your body so much more effectively against viruses. And this is what Louis Ignaro, again, he won a Nobel Prize. So listen to that guy if you're not going to yeah, listen. To I've actually, I've heard uh, Dr. Ignaro speak a, a number of times and I'm hoping I can get him on my podcast too, actually, just to talk a whole session on <laughs> nitric oxide and what he discovered because he, he won a prize for discovering this this gas, if you like, in the body, because nobody really understood what it was or how it operated. And it is, it's been used for Viagra. Um, and the reason it works for that is that it expands and dilates the blood vessels, but that's what's actually doing that in all parts of our body. And, and therefore, when we're doing this nasal breathing and we're getting more of that nitric oxide in, I mean, a lot of the athletic supplements that you can get now in your corner supplement store are, are about, you know, or drinking beetroot juice or whatever, increases your nitric oxide so this is another way to get it and for all you athletes out there you want better performance you know a lot of my athletes are on beetroot juice and things like that just nasal breathing is another way of doing it you know so that's a really big piece of the puzzle i think and those, those all work they certainly work but the, the key with so much of this just like with the key with the oxygen you you don't like go and get a bunch of oxygen for five minutes, then walk away and say, Oh, I'm, I'm all fixed. I'm now. <laughs> you want to constantly be producing this stuff. So, so beet juice, you know, will, will work for a short amount of time. But to me, it seems like a much better idea to use something that we're naturally gifted with to use our nose and to constantly be having a body that can constantly produce a healthy, healthy level of nitric oxide. Uh, I drink beet juice. I'm a big fan of that. The nitrates and other vegetables can help release more nitric oxide great stuff right but but nasal how often can you be drinking beet juice you don't want to be drinking that 10, no, 10 times lots a day of sugar in it <laughs> there's a lot of sugar in it and and you know occasionally is is great but mm. but there's other ways of doing this and you know i think our bodies are the most powerful pharmacists on on the planet and, and i think that's that's been yeah. that's been shown so so why not try to focus on your body and, and health a little bit? Well, last thing I want to mention that, that I just find is so frustrating here in the U.S. is all this talk of COVID, all this talk of, you know, wear a mask, which I'm a believer in, that stay at home, I'm a believer in that. Zero talk about not eating four double cheeseburgers a day. I mean. <laughs> Cola, like getting your health and breathing through your nose. Like, where's that conversation? getting vitamin d getting vitamin c and so uh anyway we, we've seen what what the governments you guys have a much more progressive government let me tell you we're so jealous of it but uh, now not we our have medical no society though there's nothing it's not <laughs> unfortunately yeah. but yeah and I've, I've had a number of uh, episodes um i've just done a, a five-part series on on vitamin c and intravenous vitamin c and cancer and mm -hmm. sepsis and you know the whole gamut and the problems there um and, and this every single doctor has said to me too um when it comes to covid why aren't we building up our immune system so that we pe don't get people in our icus on ventilators you know so that we don't get to that point or we have less people and <laughs> you know that just seems like a no-brainer to me but we're still promoting eating crap and drinking crap and and you know uh, and not taking into account it's you know yes i mean the vaccines and all of that but how about we just take a little bit of self-responsibility and we might not have as bad if we do get it you know like i've got a you know a mum and i've just written a book called relentless that my my listeners know about and it was about rehabilitating my mum back from an uh, aneurysm 
uh, four and a half years ago where she had massive aneurysm, hardly any higher function. I was told like she would never do anything again. I spent four and a half years rehabilitating her and she's completely normal again. She's driving the car, she's walking, talking, everything's fine. And this is why I've ended up doing what I do because I'm very passionate because none, and I mean none of this was offered in the standard medical system that we were we were in they were great at the surgeries they were great at the in the crisis but when it came to rehabilitation there was just nothing there and so I discovered all of these things and one of the passions I have is just staying one step ahead of her and giving her the next thing now she's 79 years old I want to keep her healthy so when COVID threatened us you know I've you know got over there in the corner my hyperbaric oxygen chamber and my ozone over there and my <laughs> you know uh, you name it I've got it so that if it, if it does come we're prepared as prepared as we can be and that is a good approach I think prevention rather than waiting for the disaster and then trying to pick up the pieces at the end of the day you know yeah, and I, I just want to be clear, and I know that you're saying the same thing here. There's there's doctors in my family that practice Western medicine who've helped innumerable oh, people. When, when I get in a car accident, last thing I want is acupuncture, right? <laughs> I, I want to go to the ER and have someone and surgery. do surgery. I break a bone. I'm not doing pranayama breath work. I'm going to yeah. go and get a cast. But about rehabilitation, this is 100% true because it costs a lot of money. There's no way a system can support full yeah. rehabilitation. Right. And one thing that I've heard from almost every expert in the field, whether it's a professor at a university or an MD or a nutritionist or whatever, is they believe, this isn't my view, this is their view, I want to be objective here, but they believe that there, there's a reason people aren't talking about breathing again, because there's no money in it there's no a money oh, yeah. why why the u.s government isn't isn't saying don't go to mcdonald's today that's going to shut the economy down so nope. the good news about this is people who are interested want to take control of their health there are now other means of getting information from people who have studied this stuff people who are into scientific references who are looking at science in a real objective way and so i view this thing hopefully this is going to be a lesson we can all learn that, that we can acknowledge uh, how incredible the human body is, how uh, we become susceptible to illness and how to better defend ourselves in the future. Oh, I'm just so on board with all of that. And I, and I think you, you, you're so right. And this is a problem. We do, you know, we love Western medicine. They do some brilliant things. I love naturopathic medicine. I love alternative, complementary, whatever you integrated, whatever you want to call it. We've all got deficits and we've all got blind spots in every single piece of this. And it's about bringing the whole lot together and not letting money rule the world, I think, is, a, is, is if we can ever get to that point, that'd be fantastic because it is at the moment and there's a lot of things that are being hindered, like things, simple things like breath work, like stress reduction, like intravenous vitamin Cs, like, you know, things that don't, nobody can make money at a, you know, hyperbaric oxygen is not going to make millions for anybody. So it's not getting out there. That information's not getting out there and it needs to be out there. Um, we've gone, I, I reckon we could talk for days, James, because we, we're obviously on the same track, but I wanted to touch on a couple of areas. Um, one was a, the, the whole skeletal muscle record of our ancestors and our facial, um, you know, our whole facial development and why that's part of the problem and the food problem, the, the, the mushy food that we eat today. Uh, and then remind me uh, to talk briefly about the immune system and all this and vagal, the, the vagal nerve and, and stuff. So let's start with, though, with the with skeletal record and, and the difference between our ancestors and, and how, how we are today. So early on in my research, I started hearing these stories about how humans used to have perfectly straight teeth. And I don't know if you're like me, I had extraction, braces, headgear, you name it. Every single person I knew had the same thing. It was never if, it was just, just when. This is what, how it was done. At wisdom teeth removed. If you think about how weird that is, you're like, why are we removing teeth from our, our mouths? Why are <laughs> our teeth so crooked? Where if you look at any other animal in the wild, they all have perfectly straight teeth. And what I learned was that all of our ancestors before industrialization, be, before farming, any hunter-gatherer, all had perfectly straight teeth. So uh, I went to a museum 
and looked at hundreds of skulls and they all oh. stared back at me with these perfectly <laughs> straight teeth. Wow. Completely freaked me out. They had these very broad jaws, wide nasal apertures, forward growing, powerful faces. So if you have a face that grows this way and you have a mouth that's wide enough for your teeth, you have a wider airway. Wow. By having a smaller mouth, you have less room to breathe. And this is one of the main reasons so many of us struggle to breathe. We have upper airway resistance syndrome, sleep apnea, snoring, and so many other respiratory issues is because there's less room in there. And mm -hmm. what happened is this came on in a blink of an eye with industrialized food. In a single generation, wow. people went from having perfectly straight teeth, wider nasal apertures, to having crooked teeth and smaller mouths and a different <laughs> facial profile. And this has been documented time and time again. And yet I had learned in school, which for me was a zillion years ago, that mm -hmm. this was evolution meant progress. We're, get, we're always getting yeah. stronger. Yeah. We're getting taller. We're yep. getting better. Look around today and ask yourself if that's true. It's complete garbage. Yeah. And then I went back and looked at the real definition of what evolution means. All it means is change and you yeah. can change for the better or for the worse. And humans, as far as our breathing concern is concerned, are changing very much for the worse. Wow. And so we, I mean, I'm the same. I, I grew up, I had so many extractions and teeth completely crooked and a tiny little mouth and all of those sort of problems that you, you, you're describing. And, and so what was it that our ancestors did differently? So it was just the food being not, we're not chewing as much. Was that basically it? Like that's, that was a, a, a real chain, game changer for us when the industrialization happened and we got mushy food. There were many inputs. Chewing is the main one. So when you live in an extremely polluted environment, sometimes your nose can get plugged, right? You start mm. breathing through your mouth. That can create respiratory problems. But if you breathe through your mouth long enough, your face grows that way. It actually oh, wow. changes the skeletature of your face. Mm. So that's another input. Improper oral posture um, is what that is called. But it's it's for when you're younger, chewing is so essential. And this starts with breastfeeding. There were no Gerber's food. I don't know if you have that out there, but there, there were no like soft foods just mm. a few hundred years ago. Mm. So if you think about it, you're like, hmm. So now we're eating these soft processed foods right out of the gate. We're going, we're being fed on a bottle, soft processed foods. All of our mouths are, are too small and, and too crooked. So this chewing stress starts at birth. They've done various studies looking at kids who were bottle fed versus those who were breastfed. When you're breastfed, your face pulls out, your mouth gets wider because it takes a lot of stress to do you're that. Sucking, yeah, yeah. You're two, uh, two hours a day, like yeah. every day. The, every two hours you're doing wow. and it, it literally and I've talked to parents who had twins um I just talked to, to a lady yesterday who bottle fed one didn't want to be uh, breastfed breastfed the other they look totally different wow. one has crooked teeth one has autoimmune problems one has swollen tonsils the other doesn't so oh, that is really? anecdotal but but there's been studies in the 1930s they did tons of studies into this so I'm a dude I'm not going to sit here and tell everyone they no. need to breastfed people for it and that is not my place can't. yeah but yeah. but and yeah. some some people just can't but yeah. I think it's it's important to acknowledge the the physics of how this works. And after that, if if you have bottle fed a kid, that's that's fine. But they need to start eating hard foods, baby mm. led weaning. This is what needs to happen to develop that that proper jaw, to develop that proper airway. And even if you don't do that, if you then go to soft foods and your kid is two to three years old and it's snoring or a sleep apnea, which is so common now, it's wow. so tragic because that really? leads to neurological disorders, ADHD. That early. Again, this, this isn't crazy new age. This was at Stanford. There's 50 years of research on this from the top institution here. Wow. So there are direct links between those things. But luckily we have technologies now that can help restore to the mouth to the way it was supposed to have been before industrialization. They actually widened the mouth of these small little kids and open their airways oh. and it drastically improves their health. So that's those palate expanders that you you tried out and actually as an even as an adult was you developed, I remember what was it, eight coins worth of new bone in your in your face in a in a year or something crazy. So we can still so if you've missed the boat, if you've not breast 
fed your kids or you you didn't get that yourself or whatever it's not all over there is things that you can start to do and even starting just to chew now like that to to eat some carrots and whatever you know whatever hard foods you can find to actually use those that that powerful jaw in order to make it stronger it's just like every other muscle in the body isn't it and when we're when we're when we're mouth breathing too our I remember you saying um, all the muscles here get lax and flaccid and just like any other muscle that we're not training, if we're, if we've got our mouth open all night and we're, you know, then we're uh, causing that, those muscles to be lax. And uh, over time that, that leads into sleep apnea and things as well, or can do. Um, So, yeah, so this is something that we can practically get a hold on now, even if it's a bit late for you and I being, yeah. And I, you know, I talked to my mom, I was bottle fed after like six months. My mom was like, six months was a long time when I was growing up, bottle fed, soft foods, industrialized crap. My, yeah. my all th- until I was, you know, 25 and it discovered these things called vegetables, but you know, so, so this isn't pointing the finger at anyone. We were sold this story by our governments that said you should eat mostly refined grains, eat your Cheerios, eat your bread, uh, eat your cream of wheat, eat your oatmeal, like that. this is eat your sugar, that, that's good, eat your chocolate milk, you know, so, mm. so we have knowledge now and we, we know the, the folly of our ways, but the one thing that was inspiring to me, this is easier to do when you've got a developing kid, quickly growing yeah. kid, you can set the foundation and their face will grow around, like their faces grow different. It's just, it's, it's beautiful wow. to see how the body forms to its inputs. So I, you know, youth was, was several decades ago for, for me, far, yeah. far too long. I was a child of the seventies and eighties, right? Yep, me too. So I thought once you're in middle age, you're completely screwed. What, what can you do? But that is just a convenient excuse for people to say, oh, it's genetics. Oh, I inherited this. Like genes turn on, but they can also be turned off. And so I wanted to see what I, how I could improve my airway health in a year. And so I took a CAT scan and I did proper oral posture. You were 100% right. When, when you're just eating soft, mushy food and your mouth is open, all of those tissues can grow really flabby, just like anywhere else on your body. But if you exercise them, if you exercise the jaw, the masseter, strongest muscle in the body, you know, for, for its size, the tongue, extremely powerful muscle, you exercise these things, they, they get toned like anything else. Yeah. And this can help open your airways. So this is just an anecdote. This was my experience. It'll probably be different for other people, but I did a number of these things. And a year later to the week, I took another CAT scan and the results were analyzed by the Mayo Clinic, which is one of the top hospitals here. Mm -hmm. Um, And they found that I increased my airway size about 15 to 20% in some areas. And I can't tell you just as a personal story, it has absolutely transformed my life because Mm -hmm. I can breathe so much more easily through my nose. At night, I am silent. I didn't snore before, but I was doing that. My wife would always tell me, totally silent now. And of course I am because I have a larger airway. Things are more toned. Air can enter more easily. Is it easier to find palate expanders or are these like only a couple of dentists in the world doing this sort of stuff? Not everyone needs palatal expansion. I've gotten so many hundreds of emails of people. You know how we are. It's like, what's the latest thing? Oh, there, there's a new pill. There's a new device. Oh, I got it. That's going to solve all my problems. <laughs> so they can really help people who, who need it, just like surgical interventions for people who have s- severe problems in their nose are a huge help. They're transformative. What I've found is a lot of people don't need that. And what I firmly believe is start slow, start low, see what your body can naturally do. If after six months, you're like, I'm still not, this isn't working, go see someone, you know, and and take it from there. But, But palatal expansion absolutely works for people who really need it. But you would be amazed by just doing something called oral pharyngeal exercises. There was mm-hmm. a study out in Chest, which is one of the top medical yep. journals. Yep. They found this significantly cut down on snoring, not lightly, significantly. And all it is, is exercising the tongue, roof of the mouth, proper oral posture, just working out this area, toning it. 
Of course that's going to help you if this is flabby and hasn't been Just exercised. Just like go to the gym for your mouth. <laughs> that's that's what it is. And and I view that world, there's, there's a whole separate school um, called myofunctional therapy that is helping people do this, which is so beneficial. They focus mostly on kids, but they also work with adults. Wow. And this is what they do. Right. They are the instructors, the gym instructors for your mouth and wow. for your airways. And I strongly recommend people looking that up. There's a bunch of instructionals for free on YouTube. You can go that route as well. Oh, brilliant. So we'll, we'll link to some of those uh, on your website and um, get, you know, get people those resources. That's just, it's just uh, amazing and fascinating stuff. And who would have thought this conversation would go so deep and wide. And I, I wanted to just finish up um, with talking about uh, the immune system and stress reduction and vagal nerves and uh, all of this area too, because, you know, um, me included in this and most people are dealing with you know massive levels of stress and breathing can i've uh, since i've read your book and i was already you know quite aware of how to bring my stress levels down and movement and the importance of you know yoga and and, and all of those sorts of things i had that piece of the puzzle sort of dialed in if you like but the breathing exercises and actually calming the nervous system down within minutes. Now I can fall asleep in seconds and, you know, um, well, seconds is a bit exaggerated, but minutes. And I can, I can take myself from being in this emotionally, oh my God, and I tend to be like that because I'm like, you know, busy, busy, busy. Um, and then go, hey, I'm spinning out of control. I've lost control of my breath and I, and I hear myself and I pick myself up on it now. And I go and do two minutes of breathing exercises. That's, you know, if that's all I can afford to do. And I can switch into parasympathetic now. That's been gold. Can you just explain why the heck does doing the slow, light breathing diaphragmatically stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system and the, and the vagal nerve from what's actually going on there? Sure. So what people can do now is take a hand and you can place it on your heart. And you can breathe in to a rate of about three seconds and try to breathe out to about six to eight seconds, just whatever's comfortable. Now breathe in again, one, two, three, and exhale. And as you're exhaling now very softly, you're gonna feel your heart rate get lower and lower and lower. So when you are exhaling, you are stimulating that parasympathetic side of your nervous system our breath can actually hack our nervous system function. And by exhaling more and taking these long and fluid breaths, you can trigger all of those wonderful things that happen when you're parasympathetic. You reduce inflammation very quickly. You send signals to your brain to calm down. You actually change how your brain is operating, the connectivity before the, between the prefrontal cortex and the emotional centers of the brain changes when you slow your breathing. So throughout the day, if you want to remain balanced, you take those soft and easy, light, low breaths to a count of whatever's comfortable, three, four, even up to six and six out. But if at some times you feel my stress levels are starting to increase, I'm feeling my mind slip, I'm making rash decisions, start extending the exhale. An exercise I like to do is inhale to about four exhale to six, you don't have to do it that long, inhale to three, exhale to five, whatever's comfortable. As long as that exhale is longer, longer. you're going to feel your body slowing down. Mm. And if you don't believe me, all you need to do is get your heart rate variability monitor, get yep. your pulse oximeter and take a look at what happens after 30 seconds of slow focused breathing. And you will see this transformation occur in your body. If that can happen in a couple minutes, what's going to happen to you after a couple of hours of taking control of your breathing or a couple of days or a couple of months? I'll tell you what's going to happen. I talked to dozens and dozens of people who have fundamentally transformed themselves through nothing more than breathing. I want to mention again, I'm not promising this is going to work for everyone, for everything, but it needs to be considered as a foundation to health. Yeah, and you need to stick at it for a little bit. And, you know, I do my HIV monitoring every morning before I get out of bed and do my breath-holding exercises and 
look at my bolt score from Patrick McEwen and, you know, all that sort of stuff <laughs> before I even put my feet on the floor. And I, yeah, I can control my heart rate to a degree just through my breath work. So I know this works and I know that when I do a longer exhale from the, compared to the inhale, immediately I just feel a bit more calmer and a bit more in control. And it's reminding myself, and this is the trick, because we, we, we're we in the middle of work and we've got meetings and phones are going and emails are coming at us and it's like, ah, the lion's chasing me. And it's then trying to remember to breathe and bring yourself down and calm yourself down and just take that couple of minutes many times a day, you know, depending on how stressful your life is. And, and doing that on a regular basis over time will have massive implications. Because we're talking here, your digestion, you digest food better if you're in a you know parasympathetic state versus a sympathetic, your immune system, again, coming back to COVID and that conversation, you're going to be improved, you know, your, your hormone balance, your, yeah, you know, just affects everything, the way, yeah, the brain waves, all of these things are going to be affected by your stress levels. And what is the easiest, quickest way to reduce your stress? Your breath. So I think, you know, that's a, that's a, a really, really top tip. This just before we wind up, because I know I've taken enough of your time, James. But I, I you, you did in the uh, towards the end of the book, the you went into some extreme uh, super breathing practices, which because I was like, wow, okay, because I you know read all about Wim Hof and 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 looked at his breathing techniques, and I was like, well, how 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 does that work then? Because I'm over breathing when I'm doing that. Uh, how does that work? What is there a specific time when, when that type of breathing or the extreme breathings, Wim Hof's just one of them, but, um, you know, is there a reason to be doing that type of extreme breathing stuff or can it help? Or is that just for crazies like Wim? <laughs> Good crazy, but crazy. <laughs> well, it seems so counterintuitive after learning about all these benefits of breathing less and breathing lightly to then practice something where you're breathing like this. <laughs> Yeah, And I was like, what is going on here? Yeah. These are two completely opposite things. But think about those breathing practices like going to the gym. You're not going to go to the gym for 24 hours a day. You're going to destroy your body. But going to the gym for a half an hour and working out, going to the gym for an hour and working out, this has huge benefits to you. So these breathing practices are all about working out the body and working out the respiratory system and working out your stress. Okay. So they purposely stress you out. A lot of uh -huh. people think I don't want to be stressed. I'm stressed. Why do I want to do something that stresses you out? The point is they teach you to control your stress. You consciously bring stress on and then you consciously turn it off. Uh -huh. And this hermetic stress, this short bursts of stress, are so beneficial to our bodies because we are not meant to be sitting on soft sofas and soft beds, eating soft foods, <laughs> watching soft TV programming all day. We're meant to work out sometimes. And that's what these are so effective for doing. Some people find them jarring if they haven't done any breath work. So I suggest people start with that foundation of nasal breathing, breathing awareness, breathing slowly and all that. But for some people for whom nothing else has worked, no other drug has worked. And I'm talking about people with autoimmune diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, even MS, um, uh, psoriasis. I mean, the, the list goes on and on. I have seen this time and time again, and the science is very clear that this hormetic stress, doing this in a controlled way, allows you to decrease inflammation for the other 23 and a half hours of the day. Got which it. is exactly what the parasympathetic state does. So I love, you call it Wim Hof method. He's, mm -hmm. he's the first person to say, I talk to Wim semi-often. I love what he's doing. He's such a cheerleader. He's yeah. changed people's lives. Yeah. Love the guy. He knows this isn't his method. This is thousand year old stuff. You can call yeah. it Sudarshan Kriya. You can call it Pranayama. Whatever, all these methods are so similar because they do the same thing. Mm. They have you breathe very intensely and then they have you hold your breath or not breathe at all. And then they have you breathe very intensely. So this is interval training. You see what's yeah. going on here. So this is HIT training. Wow. And for the respiratory system, I'm a huge fan of it. 
I use it as much as I can. I've seen big benefits to it. And uh, it so happens to be right down the street from me at University of California, San Francisco, Dr. Alyssa Eppel, mm -hmm. who is the expert in telomeres, uh, had a famous book out a couple of years ago. She's now studying this stuff, breathing and arthritis. Wow. And her study is coming out next month. I'm talking to her next next week. So uh, it, this funny. stuff, uh, in, in, in my view, especially with athletes, the people getting the calls now are people that are focusing on breathing. Brian McKenzie, elite instructor. Yeah, I've learned this from Brian. I was lucky. All he's that. doing. This is all he's doing now. Yeah, and these guys are just uh, next level. And I, 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 when I when I first read the the book, and I you know read Patrick's too, and I was like, hang on, I don't get this because I was into the Wim Hof stuff, and I was like, yeah, I'm doing that sort of stuff. And but you've just really clarified that for me, actually, put that into a, I sort of missed that that part of it that it is like the intense interval training. So you don't want to be doing this twenty four seven. Uh, you know, you want to do this with a specific purpose for a specific short period of time to create a stress, just like you do when you go and train your backside off and then you come back and you recover from that. And it just, that push and pull. And, and you're so right. Like we, and, and this is a, an issue in our, in our world now, we are so comfortable. We are so warm all the time and cozy, you know, in our cozy clothes and our cozy houses and our cozy cars and our we, we never get outside and we need as human beings to be pushed and pulled and out and, and, and up and down and, and have challenge you know challenge both mentally and physically I think to keep ourselves strong and we don't that's when we you know fade away and have problems and get sick and all of those sorts of things so I'm a big you know I mean pushing the limits is the name of my podcast for crying out loud you know <laughs> Definitely. I actually talked to I've talked to Patrick quite often. We correspond all the time. He and Anders Olsen told me at the beginning, they're like, oh, this heavy breathing, this is bad. This is bad. Yeah. I think Patrick's come around now. Yeah, he yeah. endorsed Wim's book. He's like, wow, this is great stuff. Yeah. So he's starting to incorporate this stuff. Because again, it's Westerners, it we always think it needs to be one or the other. You're the slow breather. You're the fast breather. You're you're paleo or you're vegan. You're keto. Yeah. <laughs> These things all have benefits. To me, they're more tools in the toolbox to use at different times. And we're showing this: these short periods of intense breathing can really be this pressure release valve for stress. Yeah. And and I'd I'd be surprised if someone does the Wim Hof method or Tumo. I'd be surprised if anyone is feeling more stressed after that. I mean, to me, I find this is a very powerful tool. I use it before sleep sometimes. And man, the second my head hits the pillow, I'm gone and I'm gone oh, that, for eight hours. And th that's, that's what you want. That's brilliant. And it's good to, yeah, that Patrick's um, seen that, that too. And Patrick's coming on the show in, in a few weeks time. So I'll ask him about it. Cause I, you know, like I've been, Ooh, do I, you know, cause I, 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 I've been doing the Wim Hof stuff previously and now I've like, Ooh, backed off of it, but now I might have another crack at it again and go a little bit deeper and just see if I can, you know, get to the next level because I mean, the slow breathing for most of the time and certainly controlled in the, in the, in the training and the, in the, in the running and so on um, is, is what you want to be doing most of the time. But we want these little stresses, these hermetic stresses in order to improve. And uh, guess how Wim breathes the rest of the time. He normal. breathes through his nose yeah. He breathes yeah. extremely slowly and he hums a lot. Because that's what I mean, it's going to increase nitric oxide. So this is, everyone sees him as the maniac screaming at you to breathe. They don't <laughs> see him the, the other 23 and a half hours a day where he's very chill, you know? Yeah. So, so th this is, again, it's not one or the other. It's, it's able to look at the benefits of all these things, just like the benefits of all these different foods and to pick out the ones that work for you and to use them. Excellent. I think that's a beautiful place to wrap it up. James, thank you so much for writing this incredible book and for sharing your knowledge and spending so many years, because I know this was a lot of years of research that went into this. Please, please, everybody go out there and buy this book, get the word out there, share it with your friends and family. The links will be uh, in the show notes, but James, where, where can people find you and, and your book and uh, where are they best to get it? 
My website is a good place to start. I've listed all of the scientific references because I know this stuff sounds completely wacko. <laughs> uh, you can see videos. You can see expert Q and A's with Harvard's uh, Harvard professors. Uh, there's exercises from Johns Hopkins. Uh, all of this is free, um, and it's at mrjamesnester.com. There's links to the book, too, because the how of breathing is the easy part. It's, to me, I found the more interesting story was the what does it do? Where does this come from? Yeah. You know, uh, it, in what ways can it help benefit us? And that, yeah. that's what I focused on. I'm also on Instagram, trying to get better at the social media crap, <laughs> um, and I'm posting things related to, to only breathing there. Yeah, uh, yeah, Instagram, you probably need to do a bit of Wim Hof before you jump on it because it's no. all the social media has drives me nuts too. <laughs> but we have to do it. We live in this world. We have to do it. <laughs> we do. James, thank you so much. It's been an absolute honor to meet you. And uh, I'm, I'm really, really grateful to you. You have to promise in six months after continuing to nasal breathe and work out, I want to hear a full report on, on where your endurance levels are and your performance levels are. You okay? got it. Maybe I'll be competing again. Wouldn't that be <laughs> okay. That sounds great. <laughs> Thanks a lot for having me.